So hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who were able to, who were unable to attend yesterday, I'm Carlos Baracco. I'm a program officer in the Division of Clinical Research at NINDS. And today is the second day of our Imaging the Future of In Vivo Neuropathological Diagnosis through Postmortem Analyses Workshop. Um, you know, from what we saw yesterday, I think our workshop was quite successful. The questions asked during the both groups, the bench work, modern high throughput pathology and in vivo and postmortem imaging groups produced some excellent discussions and definitely raised various issues and questions that we needed to learn about on the extramural side of NIH. So we definitely hope to continue that today <clears throat> with the data analytics discussion as well as with the breakout groups. And I had scheduled about 15 minutes for a recap um, this, you know, this afternoon, but I certainly don't think we need all that time since, again, based on yesterday's discussion, I think we'll see some similar, sim excuse me, similar themes uh, reemerge with the data analytics discussion. Um, with that being said, let me quickly explain what the structure of the breakout uh, groups will be before summarizing those themes that did emerge yesterday. Uh, so as most of you saw, uh, when you registered, you were able to indicate to us what your breakout group preference would be. Um, but given the themes that arose during yesterday's discussion, we decided that we'd have the breakout groups focus on emerging themes from the actual workshop rather than be then focus on the topics of the discussion groups themselves. So the four themes that we identified and have chosen for the breakout groups are training and interdisciplinary activities uh, as one. The second would be infrastructure. Third would be methods, technology, and, and technology development. And the fourth would be data and nomenclature standards uh, or harmonization. So uh, the themes that emerge from each are the following. So with respect to training and interdisciplinary activities, uh, the uh, questions that arose are the topics that arose as well, and that we would like to have answered are what the training pipeline itself could be, how can we restructure it so that it is more inter interdisciplinary, and how do we cultivate um, more academically minded neuropathologists. Uh, for the infrastructure uh, group, uh, questions or topics that arose were things like, do we fund the boarding centers to pull all the large studies together so that we therefore up sample sizes? Um, you know, do, do we set up some sort of central coordination of clinical data to funnel into postmortem imaging and uh, the neuropathology work? And, you know, one thing that we, want to understand in general is uh, from some of you, especially that have been successful, what have you found that works best for acquiring, you know, diverse tissue samples or communicating uh, with and informing diverse or minoritized populations about tissue donation? Um, for the methods and technology development uh, group, you know, we're interested in things like how, how we solve the problem of scaling, you know, between MR and neuropathology, right? These are very different scales, but, you know, what, what is, what is, how do we how do we address this issue that seems to be facing everyone? Um, and you know what 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 has been the most successful so far? I think we heard about some of that yesterday, but we're certainly interested to hear from those that you know weren't uh, uh, primary discussion. You no, know, similarly, are there cost contract agents that can be developed uh, that better correlate with uh, neuropathology stains? Um, another question is, um, you know, I think I think it was mentioned that, uh, or it was it was. A point was made that we really don't have, you know, reliable biomarkers um, for for disease progression uh, for MRI. So, you know, is machine learning really going to help us in this respect? Um, if you don't think it is, or you don't see that it's not currently, uh, what are the primary issues or barriers to that? And lastly, for the data and number and nomenclature standards or harmonization group, um, you know, we're interested in knowing. What are the issues that you're experiencing communicating imaging, neuropathology, and or, you know, your analytical findings or methods? And what do you believe are some of the best potential solutions to these issues? Or, you know, what is, what is the best course of action to reach these solutions? Um, additionally, another theme that, that we heard, uh, or another topic that we heard quite often uh, was the issue of balancing harmonization within innovation, so that we don't stifle innovation by you know, having too, you know, too much harmonization. <laughs> so um, how do you balance that? Uh, what are the areas in which complete harmonization do you think would impede innovation the most? And which are the areas in which it might not? Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's where that balance 
this potentially. So again, this is what the breakout groups will be focused on. Of course, we still have to hear from the data analytics group. And so we'll add in the appropriate questions or topic themes as they arise. Um, and right once that discussion is over, we will move to the breakout groups and you'll have the opportunity to choose your breakout group, as I mentioned. <clears throat> so a few things to keep in mind before we actually get started with a discussion. I think you know everybody did a really great job yesterday. Um, things are pretty orderly. Just make sure to keep your camera off and your mic muted if you are not actively speaking or if you're not one of the speakers. Um, you know, if, if you have a question that you would like to ask, raise your hand and, you know, if, 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 and your the moderator will call you at the right time. Or, you know, we can you can leave your question until the end and type it in the chat and the moderator will uh, bring that up. And so, yeah, I think with that being said, we can probably get started uh, with the first discussion. So um, Bennett Landman will be leading that discussion and I'll, and I will moderate uh, at the get go or the beginning now. Uh, so I was trying to get to. So our panelists ah, today, okay. um, there we go. Got the slides in the right order now. Would you like to oh. say hi starting at the top? Brittany, that's you. But I don't know there's so many top people on this panel, so <laughs> alphabetically by last name to keep it easy. No, right, uh, some. very honored to be here. And I just want to thank everybody on the call because we know that people have very busy schedules and for you guys to take the time out of your day to, to chime in and, and participate in this um, is just phenomenal. So thank everybody so much, especially all the organizers and all the other panelists yesterday. You guys are fantastic. Um, so I'm Dr. Brittany Duggar. I'm here at the University of California, Davis. Go Aggies. Um, I am the co-leader of the UC Davis Brain Bank, which we serve many programs, one being the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, we also serve um, some candles or some studies out of uh, Kaiser Permanente, which is a healthcare network. Uh, this includes the Life After 90. So I have the great privilege of looking at brains that are almost a century old, um, as well as the candle study. Um, and I wear many hats. I'm also a co-leader of the machine learning working group here um, within the School of Medicine. And I also am, uh, I help lead the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center Digital Pathology Working Group, which um, there's a lot of members on this call. So just really excited to be here and data analytics, right? It's all about data, um, not the one on Star Trek, but you know, the one um, that we all deal with. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Hugo. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Hugo Gertz. I'm currently head of neuroscience quantitative system pharmacology at uh, Certara, which is a company that provides uh, modeling and, and simulation support for research and development in, uh, in uh, all different indications. In the previous life, I was a bona fide discovery scientist at Janssen Research Foundation. I was involved in the third successful approved medication for Alzheimer's disease, but that was a long time ago. Uh, I'm more of a kind of an human augmented intelligence uh, person in the sense that um, uh, I believe in uh, mechanistic modeling of biological processes um, that might shed light on the kind of relationship between anti-mortem clinical scales and the post-mortem uh, pathology that, uh, that we are discussing here. So that might be another angle rather than AI and machine learning, more the kind of human augmented intelligence to uh, bridge that gap there. Thank you. Thanks, Hugo. Uh, David? Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for uh, inviting me. I'm excited to participate. Uh, David Irwin, University of Pennsylvania, uh, co-direct the Penn Frontal Temporal Degeneration Center, where I uh, lead the clinical core for the FTD and Louis Bonnie module. And my lab looks at human brain histopathology, integrating it with image analysis and uh, digital histopathology for biomarker validation and discovery. That's right. Or I guess, Bennett, you can go. We can go by the order on the, the type order out instead of the pictures. Great. I'm Bennett Lemon. I'm at Vanderbilt University in electrical computer engineering. And I do a lot of AI and medical image processing. And a lot of that has started to involve validation with postmortem samples and bringing in vivo and postmortem together. Thanks. All right, Partha. Hi, I'm Partha Mitra. I'm Crick Clay, professor of biomathematics at Cold Spring Harbor laboratory. I'm a theoretical physicist by training, and I did work on MRI uh, diffusion microgeometry measurements as a PhD student. So I have MRI in my portfolio, but I'm running a high throughput neurohistology pipeline. So I also have pathology 
in my portfolio, and that's been to map mouse brain circuits, marmoset brain circuits, and now whole human brain atlasing and circuit mapping. And I, but my main gig really is uh, uh, data analysis. So uh, machine learning, AI uh, applied to what I call a virtual neuroanatomist or a virtual neuropathologist. So trying to automate ourselves. Thanks, Martha. Um, I think Dimitri is still here. Um, so Joey, go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, yeah, hi, um, I'm Zuko Tosson. I'm an associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco. And and I direct the Medical Informatics and Artificial Intelligence Center. Thank you. Well, when Dimitri gets on, hopefully we can introduce him. He, he was definitely on yesterday and participating, so hopefully everyone knows who he is. Um, but Ben, yeah, um, I'll let you go ahead and take the lead. And I guess, sorry, I interrupted Great. your, your so, flow no, here. No, I, I had this <laughs> I'm slide out of order. I'm sorry, I got this one over. Um, so, Basically, we want to come together, and from my perspective, we're building a system for AI discovery because everything is getting information out and getting this captured in qualitative ways. At Vanderbilt, we start with data from the clinical systems, from the scanners, from our postmortem specimens, and we're always focused on trying to get this into translation or discovery. Um, we have a number of platforms here from our biobank repositories, our data science institute, School of Engineering and Medicine, working together really through our Institute for Clinical Translational Research to provide annotation, get context to medical expertise, perform machine learning, do reviews and publications in effective ways, really looking at the science of learning and communication, getting this into pragmatic trials, and then translating it into workable practice. Today, I've asked everyone on the panel to put together a couple of slides to be sort of what they are seeing in their perspective. So I put them in order. If you'd like to step in and talk about your slides, that would be great. Otherwise, you can hear me talk about your slides. Um, Hugo, you're up first. Um, yeah, so um, I think the idea that I wanted to propose here is to actually go to a kind of human augmented intelligence in the sense that we want to um, let's say develop uh, computer models of uh, biological processes that might uh, that are inspired by uh, many decades of neurobiological research, um, and so that might be a way to actually uh, both uh, being informed by data from pathology, but also the other way around to look at hypothesis testing to see whether some of the um, the uh, biomarkers can be actually detected in in in, uh, in postmortem analysis. But I think the major aspect is the fact that. The, the human brain actually functions before that. And so the clinical outcome is driven by the activity of neuronal circuits that are firing action potentials. And so um, we have been working on both fMRI as, uh, as a way to look at functional uh, results in, uh, uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, uh, as well as, well as, as in psychiatry. Uh, and, and that is maybe a kind of an, an angle that not has been, uh, let's say, discussed that much in, uh, in the previous day yesterday. I think most of the MRI that we're discussing here is based on structural uh, MRI, but I think beyond that, beyond the substrate, there is also the whole uh, rich dynamics of functional activity that we can measure with both of MRI. So that's basically everything I wanted to, to mention here. Let's see, Dimitri is not on. Um, I am not seeing um, Dimitri else on but they are presenting hopefully later on tissue microstructural imaging with the idea of using post-mortem imaging to go within the voxel and get a, a deep cellular characterization of what's going on to validate in vivo biomarkers to um, look at other possible markers of what's happening so Partha, I think yeah, we have two um, slides here this one to first of all thank the organizers for inviting me here this workshop is really of great interest to me. Uh, I got started actually collaboration with Larry Latour. I want to just pop up there. We looked at precisely the MR histology correlation that we're talking about. I um, uh, won't talk about it in, in, in great detail, but this work was published. It was about uh, traumatic microbleeds, but this kind of got me on the journey. Uh, and then next slide, um, um, if you want uh, to... Yeah, yeah. So this is the one that I want to draw these groups' attention to. So I, I am um, uh, running a project, and this actually involves uh, Els, Dimitri, Jiang, Yang, Zhang from NYU, but also David Nowen, who's a neuropathologist from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, 
Um, we, we also have actually just received tissue from the uh, HBCC, Stefano Marenko. So these collaborations that we're talking about, you know, we're actually doing here. Um, uh, so the brains are coming from uh, those uh, JHU, HBCC to M NYU for MRI, tissue microstructure, then we are sectioning them at, in my lab, uh, a high throughput neurohistology pipeline, um, uh, digitally scanning, and uh, then, you know, the data analytics part, as I've been pointing out, is really key. Um, we really hope to bridge between pathology, radiology, um, and, and the molecular stuff. And the one thing I will say is that uh, high uh, 3D histology, I think, is the key bridge between MR and histology. The histology is done on small pieces with single 2D sections. That's the norm. There are exceptions. But breaking that exception and, and really making 3D histology uh, is going to be. I, I see that Dimitri is, is, is back on. Okay, sorry, I ran from a different meeting. Great, I will back up a slide if I can here. Oh, oh yes, thank you. So I'm Dmitry Novikov, uh, a faculty at NYU uh, Radiology, and together with Els Freemans, we spearhead the tissue microstructure imaging effort at NYU using mostly diffusion, but also transverse relaxation. And the point is to use biophysical modeling to really map uh, quantitatively and reliably parameters of the brain at the cellular level. Uh, and we design both models as well as all the uh, image processing pipelines, starting from essentially raw data and correcting for all artifacts. Thank you. Great. So I really enjoyed part of the slide there. So I inserted mine right after this. This is our team who is working with Wes Ely on one study that involves pre-mortem um, ICU imaging, followed by discharge, followed by eventual brain donation, post-mortem imaging, and assessment. I wanted to highlight there's a lot of people involved in these studies. Each of them has an area of expertise from you know, the, the patient consent and the coordination and the care to the transport, to the Im even vivo imaging, to the um, eventual return to clinic, to follow up over the phone, to the data analysis and all of those things. And keeping everyone on the same page in a transparent manner is why I'm standing in the back trying to get the data and analytics and transparency of the systems to show this is where the study is. So the big boss over here can see where the study is going and we're able to do the science. And for that, that means a lot of image processing, a lot of AI for me. Um, we're also working on other large scale studies, um, including the NHS ADSP program, which is involved in a I think 13 or 15 sites spending account, phenotype harmonization with genetics, and then getting this all to be AI ready and release all of this data. These are also very large teams that are bringing the cell repositories, coordinating centers, Lonnie for data and scan, all with NIGADs for coordination of the ethics to get them all together, process the data, really work on site harmonization and site coordination making sure the common data elements are filled out, but not overly onerous, because if you have a million data elements and no one fills out, it, they're not useful. So making sure we have minimum viable data sets um, that are shared and really bringing this into, again, a team structure across coordinating centers where each work, you know, it's a younger version of me up here, um, working on the diffusion imaging, but each center able to put in their expertise and Dugu's also on this. Um, and, getting this together as a team effort that then the sort of biology and the pathology and the eventual basic sciences can be done with these monumental size of efforts. And so that's why I'm interested in this data analytics section. And um, thank you, Carlos, for bringing these topics up. No, thank you all again. This is an amazing group and hopefully you guys are on the call starting to appreciate the depth and the breadth of this data analytics group. So we all form this bigger picture of all these teams. And I'm gonna come at this from the angle of the Alzheimer's disease research centers of which you heard some of the speakers yesterday in some of the groups. And to emphasize if, if you're just joining us, 
throughout the Alzheimer's disease recent, uh, research centers. And here's a wonderful map. So locate the Alzheimer's disease research center nearest you. Um, we have well-characterized patients and control subjects, and this is neuropaths, so some of them do come to autopsy. And so there's over a thousand decedents um, across the country, and we have biospecimens and data on this. And if you can hit the space bar, Bennett to show the next. And I wanted to just highlight, because uh, one of the things that um, we've, we've seen a lot of amazing techniques, and I'm gonna make an analogy here. I look at that as maybe like a Ford GT, right? It's an amazing technology, high performance. Um, but the thing is a lot of these neuropath cores are that road, right? People are requesting these tissues. So um, are we driving a Ford GT on a dirt road? Do we need to make some improvements on maybe a build back better brain banks? little thing there. Um, so this is just kind of the workflow that we have. We have a lot of processes along the way before we get brains. And each one of those points is data, our data um, that are very important. Um, and then if you can hit the space bar again, Bennett. And just to highlight, this was a survey that we did across the Alzheimer's disease neuropath cores uh, back in 2019. And I just wanted to highlight some of these data. And um, I, I know uh, back in the day, there was only about 30. And so this was uh, some of these um, results are based out of check all that apply. I just want to highlight a few things. So how we're identifying our specimens within our brain bank. Some of that is still handwritten. Just wanted to kind of have you digest that um, as we're talking about data analytics. Um, also, when we're talking about management softwares, a lot of us are still using Access and Excel. So um, yesterday it was kind of mentioned about laboratory information systems and understanding how we can maybe improve those roads there. Um, also, aspects of quality control with our data. Um, there's a lot of different processes that people can do for quality control. And again, this is check all that applies. So I just wanted to kind of show some data and some metrics to kind of get people's minds thinking on this workshop of even though, yes, there's a lot of amazing techniques, but how can we maybe improve those roads for that 4GT to drive on? Um, next slide. Um, and then again, just to set the stage, uh, and I think a lot of us are focusing on this, we're exploring this neuropathological landscape because we really wanna try to make this connection to clinical pathological, log logical and translational research. So to just kind of simplify this, we're trying to ask the who, what, where, and when, right? And then if you hit the space bar um, again, uh, Bennett, because this is gonna lead to that why and how for better therapeutics, better diagnostic prognostics, right? So again, just taking that step back and framing, you know, getting those juices flowing for these discussions. And then the next slide, which is my last one here on our stuff. If you hit the X button, Bennett, thank you. And so one way, um, and again, I'm humbly coming before you because it takes a village, it takes an army. Um, whatever analogy you want to do. I have the great privilege of working with a lot of different disciplines to make this happen. Um, so one of the things that we're trying to do with so many amazing, wonderful people is trying to develop scalable, generalizable. I really want to emphasize that term, especially when there was a lot of talk about cohort specific um, algorithms and quantitative analysis, but we really want to push that generalizable and interpretable uh, quantitative tools for neuropathological assessments. And we're thinking about tasks rather than jobs. And these are just some few examples of papers that we've published, but we're not the only group. There's a lot of groups working on this, um, but again, just thinking of how how we can be better together to end the scourge of these awful, awful diseases. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, this is a slide. So uh, as a cognitive neurologist, uh, see patients with neurodegenerative disorders and been lucky and privileged to have experimental neuropathological training as well. And um, in our clinical core, we do standardized assessments and contribute to NIH consortia, all FTD, um, DLBC for, for dementia with Lewy bodies, collecting harmonized assessments uh, like we've heard about. And um, as a neurologist, the question is always fascinates me of these different pathologies and how they interact or mimic each other and how we can uh, are always humbled as a clinician to what the autopsy or postmortem findings are despite careful clinical characterization. So my lab uh, fits at the interface of this where we take uh, autopsy tissue 
and analyze it with new digital histopathological techniques and informatics to help integrate these clinical modalities with uh, the ground truth uh, histopathology data, not only to validate some of the metrics we accumulate during life, but also learning more about the cellular vulnerabilities to guide those new uh, diagnostics. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so our overall approach, um, that's done in the lab. We have essentially two main streams of tissue uh, in collaboration with Eddie Lee and was um, uh, fostered by D John Trojanowski, my mentor, and really facilitated all of the infrastructure that we have today to, to work on all of this. And um, what we've done as uh, bilateral sampling at high density is to augment the neuropathological sampling for diagnosis using standard one by three uh, sections and um, building a digital library from our autopsy cases. So we use tissue microarrays with uh, relatively standardized disease and control cores to normalize staining intensity between staining runs to do large scale uh, studies and generate large scale digital pathology data uh, want to account for that more systematically. So we that's our approach where each staining run has a control slide and we can then use uh, open source tools to segment, uh, sample the regional anatomy and measure different histopathological features. And um, more recently doing machine learning uh, methods to detect different objects. And here's an example of work that we've been doing trying to detect cortical layers and laminar profiles of neurons, uh, which is uh, challenging without stereology. So for looking for more high throughput methods and uh, in co collaboration with Paul Yuskovich and Dylan Tisdall um, at the Penn Imaging and Computer Science la uh, Lab, we're able to also take a hemisphere and do whole hemisphere ex vivo imaging, a 3D printed mold that's individual patient specific to guide our cutting guides and sample larger cassettes that we can map and register directly to uh, the MR and uh, working through the workflow to uh, register in vivo to ex vivo to tissue and try to scale those different um, scales from micro to macro. And all of this data is eventually going to go into our integrated neurodegenerative disease database where all the clinical genetic biofluid data is stored and harmonized. So um, that's our general approach and what we're working on. The next slide uh, is just is a quick um, uh, example of how this approach and how we're using this approach to model neurodegenerative disease in the human brain. And this was a study led by Min Cheng in um, uh, the in Pixel, where we looked at our FTD cohort, where tau, TDP43 are clinically similar, and we could look at uh, graph theory using a covariance network, or the, essentially the correlation between pathologic burden. And um, the main take home is that despite clinically looking similar, there were much different interactions between gray and white matter pathology. Next slide, please. Um, which we can highlight in new ways that are akin to what's done in in vivo imaging network science. And we're working to start to integrate um, these patterns seen post-mortem with in vivo. Thanks. Thank you. And so now we're gonna open up into the panel discussion. I think the easiest thing to do is um, to not share the slides. Um, and Carlos, let me know if you'd rather have me share the slides. But we have a, a set of questions that we've come up with for open discussion. Um, and how about if I read them and then whoever wants to chime in and we also will have the chat that, um, that you're monitoring, right? Okay, we'll go with that. So the first hey, question- ben, ben, it, one quick thing, because we had a lot of discussion yesterday uh, and those questions were gathered before. Uh, you maybe want to, you know, pick and choose questions and maybe even introduce new ones. Okay. Um, I'm happy for other people to put as many questions as they would like in and um, feel free to drop them in the chat. So I will drop the first question in the chat. And the first one is on infrastructure needs, not just to Carlos, but to everyone here. Um, considering the state of the current ADRD biorepository infrastructure, is it adequate to meet our needs? What needs to be done sort of at the road level um, that Brittany was talking about. Do you want to kick it off since I think you've already touched on this a little bit? 
Um, I also want to hear there's some great colleagues on the line too, because um, I have my own personal experiences paradigms. I just think of a lot of the times when um, grants are given, they're very hypothesis driven. Um, and we're always focused a lot on that high performance vehicle rather than building up the infrastructure aspect and just understanding what kind of ways and mechanisms that we could do to enhance that. Or if anybody has solutions on how their centers have improved their roads. Um, Eddie Lee talked about, um, what was it yesterday about he built a database, but that took 20 years to build that database. So just thinking about those investments and understanding how we can make that improvement over time. Uh, so we might not get into this situation of potentially crumbling infrastructure. And I'm trying to use these terms very, very lightly because I know we are making great successes, but again, how can we build back better? Could, could I ask a question? To you, who are the users? Um, are they all local to the to the roads, or are there cars coming in from outside and driving on the roads? Because that uh, the the user base probably drives who will, you know, in in some sense, be most uh, engaged in doing this. Yeah, we get, I mean, here at UC Davis, we get requests that are international. We get requests that are national, even within our institution. So there's a variety of requests and persons that we serve um, to better the community and getting requests in a variety of forms from frozen brain to wet tissues to um, formal and fixed paraffin embedded sections. If that's, does that kind of answer your questions on, on who's using what? Uh, well, the question is, can that be turned into then, you know, getting more support for what you are what, what you're asking, uh, if I understood your question correctly, there's a need for improving this infrastructure. And then the question is who will help improve the infrastructure? Presumably people who are using it will be the best advocates for, for help. Yeah, no, and you, 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 you bring a good question up and this is always like one of the things that has been discussed, it's 50-50 is like user fees. Like should we charge user fees, um, but then you're paying a cost recovery. I'm being very careful with that language. Um, and I see Dirk King, uh, Dr. Keen, if you wanna contribute, because I know you have um, definitely things to share as well. <laughs> Um, thanks, Brittany and Partha. It's your suggestion is interesting, but the way that the and we're talking about the Alzheimer centers, but this this applies, I think, to any kind of a brain a biorepository uh, model. So if you have a biorepository that's built to support itself exclusively on fees that are generated from people using the biorepository, then you could build in cost through those fees to help sustain and improve infrastructure. But unfortunately, that's not the way this works. As Brittany was saying, the way this works is we're set up as core centers. There's a research component that used to be uh, the form of projects that's been removed. So we are, we are, we the Alzheimer centers are purely research support centers. And so um, most of us have some level of, uh, of um, compensation that we try to, that we try to rec recoup from our um, from sharing tissues, but I'll I'll tell you at UW, and we last year we shared about ten thousand tissue samples. We don't we don't ask everybody to pay us for the tissue. We feel like we're funded to do that, and so what we're not funded to do is to build out you know to, con to continuously improve infra infrastructure. So the clunky solution that we are all dealing with right now is supplements. And so we're using a we're we're applying for a supplement to support uh, implementation of a new limbs. We we transitioned to Redcap a few years ago, essentially just just you know pulling in sort funding as where we could to try to make it work. And so I think Brittany's point is a really really important one that even well funded established research centers don't really have a great mechanism to maintain this kind of infrastructure development and if we want to build something new there's there you know NIH and other funders aren't excited about building the infrastructure they're excited about funding really great hypothesis driven science which um you know I just am really glad that, that this has been brought up because it's a major issue in our field yeah and just second Dirk that's what we've gotten to improve ours is we did an administrative supplement to get a barcoding system to use open specimen, because before we were just using Excel, but then there's also the issue of QC, because we keep on getting brains in, right? So how do you go back and, and do that? Like TDP, somebody had a comment on TDP 43. TDP 43 came on board, what, um, 
in the NAC forms in 2012, 2014 in that version, but we have all these older cases. So how do we add that data? Do we not add that data? How like stuff like this kind of things of filling in those gaps is, as there's great successes in the field, but we have brain banks that have been in existence for 20, 30 years. And I, I don't mean to uh, speak too many times, but um, I, I will kind of second this, what you just said about paper records, won't name the major pharmaceutical company, but in recently I was visiting a histopathology lab at a major pharmaceutical company. They were handwriting, this is a very wealthy company. They were handwriting in the, uh, anatomic pathology laboratory, you know, toxicology laboratory, uh, their, their records, uh, uh, no limbs actually. And um, it's not just a government you know, funded research issue. I think it's that neuropathology has been in the backwaters to some extent because other things seem more exciting, but I think neuropathology is really exciting. And, and it is exciting because the images contain structural information that people will access through machine learning, through uh, you know morphological analyses that anatomic pathologists for uh, hun you know hundreds of years actually have been uh, basing medicine on. So I think one bigger picture thing that you're saying is really make this field more exciting, and people recognize that it's uh, it's uh, that it's not okay to keep uh, paper records and not track all the samples, and that needs to be funded. Um, David? I just wanted to comment. I, I think it's a great point, Brittany and Dirk and, and Partha, about infrastructure and the need and how to balance that with trying to maintain the science. And I think an interesting, not only database needs, but also data storage needs. The digital pathology is one way to share images of pathology is a great way to do open science where you could have images accessible in a cloud system, for example, where scientists can, and we do this with labs, we collaborate, we're able to transfer um, images and then things can be run on one lab and you know, reproduced in the other lab and even use different image analysis platforms. But the costs uh, grow exponentially the more that you data you acquire. So it is an interesting element of um, you know, that infrastructure, I think. And, and ownership of that data, one might point out, like if this is like really shared data, uh, because I mean, I don't need to say there are unicorns out there now, whether they'll remain unicorns, I don't know, in the digital pathology space, that it, it's all been about the ownership of the pathology image data. So if there are kind of public repositories, and, and I, did, I know that CA Big had, had something, but there's nothing at scale. Um, and I know Harry is trying, you know, we are trying, but. Uh, publicly shared data of that sort, centrally supported, I think would make a huge difference. Yeah, data protection is actually a big part of that too. I think Brittany, you mentioned the barcoding. So finding ways to store and annotate that those images and protect, you know, and link to, you know, NAC, for example, or other NIH repositories, that would be a great element of infrastructure development too. Do you? Um, just a quick comment, actually following up what um, Dr. Mitra just mentioned about, um, I'm coming from, from imaging perspective, but my background is neuroimaging, and um, I, I guess there, there's some envy towards neuroimaging groups, because um, we've been sharing lots of data, we, we, we have some standardization and harmonization happening finally across different cohorts, and data sharing has been a big effort in neuroimaging, and um, that initiative, the data sharing um, idea that started about a decade or maybe two decades ago actually shaped the um, data storage or, or how to define the data for imaging data. So one of the questions I, I often have with the neuro neuropathology or the autopsy data, I, I don't do the, the, I don't request the tissues. Um, I don't request the, um, the digital images, but there, there is definitely a huge um, demand on the neuropathology reports and even getting those for, from different studies and even comparing those from different studies uh, has been so challenging because we, we really don't see, we, we really don't know the history about the data we are getting sometimes from different, um, different groups or different cohorts. And 
I think part of that is this data sharing might be a little bit new in autopsy and neuropath communities um, compared to the level of data sharing we're doing in imaging in other domains, which pushed us to really define standard protocols and um, standard terms or standard databases. Um, that might be a starting like a discussion starting point to discuss what um, would really need, need to be in that database or the, the storage system or um, what needs to be um, standardized or defined um, to truly cover all the information about uh, the tissue, all the information about processes um, required to achieve that final neuropathology report. Many of us are really interested in from neuroimaging perspective, from validating biomarker discovery based on gold standard ground truth um, neuropathology. So there are some comments in the chat about S10 and appropriate mechanisms. Um, I'd like to sort of follow up on, I, I'm seeing the nose on S10s and I, I get why. Um, my question here is in terms of the return on investment, what is the way to say why funding agencies should put in a barcode spanner? What are the, what are, you know, they're not the, highest profile, newest awards, the great technology that S10s are really, you know, this is a new device, it'll do something great. What is a metric that we can use to say this will increase throughput, reliability, historical accuracy, those kind of things to really drive investment. So to realize that funding agencies aren't just like filling in potholes, that they are building infrastructure that will um, drive, allow the next um, generation of science to drive. So I'm just going to chime in. Real, so this is an excellent question, and there are cautions about this too. So one thing that we're going through right now is we implemented a barcode system, but a lot of these are proprietary systems. And sometimes when you have a homegrown system that you've had for 20 or 30 years and you want to connect it to a proprietary system, there's a lot of front end and back end issues. So there's a lot of other things to think about with these questions of wanting to improve infrastructure. I'm trying not to open up that can of worms, but just to make people aware of this, because these are some growing pains that we're going through with this of, OK, how do we make things different databases? This is a data analytics section. Also talk to one another if we want to improve our infrastructure. The, the flip side of that is, do you want to redo it completely? Because uh, I mean, in, in uh, it, it's a, those of us who are doing kind of high, high throughput histology imaging are not using legacy system. You know, we, we rebuilt, uh, we'd be happy to share by the way, uh, what, what we have built. And there are uh, um, various initiatives inside the brain initiative that are looking at large imaging data sets, uh, not from pathology data, but from brain imaging data you know, uh, mice mostly, but uh, now going to other species. So could pull in some of those tools, you know, but it might require rebuilding. Uh, it may not be, may not be portals to build, to build the road anew, <laughs> might save, save money at the end of the day. But yes, actually, it's a good point is maybe is there is a way to have an age wide, like a template or database where you could, any group can put any uh, imaging uh, data, for instance, like we have thousands of high um, advanced diffusion MRI cases of uh, anonymized patients in, with different diseases, and as well as normals. I mean, in principle, other people could download and apply their modeling and uh, AI or image processing techniques. Are, I mean, to maintain it for, for people will cost us money, nobody will pay pays us that. It has nothing to do with neuropathology, but I mean, there is, I think every group faces similar problems. So, so Dimitri, real quick, you said an NIH wide system. Can, can you just explain quickly? Like, 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 I know that, uh, for instance, within ISMRM, uh, the MRI society, uh, there is a like a standard MS ISMRM D format for, for 
uh, for the data. So people are already trying to standardize things. But like, if I wanted to say over the past 10 years, we've acquired literally over 5,000 cases of different diseases, uh, say advanced diffusion and advanced MRI imaging data. It's just, you know, we have uh, diagnosis, clinical clinical indications, as well as advanced imaging. In principle, why not the whole world uh, use it and apply their own processing uh, or data mining, mining methods on that? I don't know where to put it. I don't know, you know, if I were to maintain this database somehow myself, it will cost money, it takes time, it uh, takes our attention away from other things, our commitments on grants. The, the Brain Initiative has various repositories, you know, uh, BIL, um, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, there's one at MIT. So, so, um, so maybe I am not aware of that, but like, can I just put my stuff there for free and say, okay, it's anonymized, you know, the whole world use it. Is there, is there a standard right. way of doing that? I, I presumably, ideally, one place where everybody is using similar, you know, standards so that we can search across, you know, say I'm interested in Alzheimer's disease, and there are 10 different centers that do advanced, say, MRI on Alzheimer's, and we are one of them. Say I want to use, uh, apply interesting processing techniques and, and mine through the whole thing. Is there, is, it, is there a simple way of doing this? Is this the infrastructure we envision? Because so far, the 10 groups have their own different uh, servers that they store this data. It's all behind some firewalls. I have no idea. But Dimitri, I, I thought that MRI was much in much better shape. You, you're saying that even the MRI... No, well, I, I think there's such a thing as an NIH syndrome, where NIH stands for not invented here, which means everybody's... <laughs> Everybody has their own little ways of, you know, storing things, processing things, and uh, this is the human natural. connectome project uh, repositories. You cannot upload there. I don't know. I I never thought we're eligible. Maybe I don't know. I mean, we just I, maintain it ourselves. We're definitely trying to address that imaging issue at an INDS. I mean, it's definitely very complicated. We've, we've, been, we've been thinking about how to do that and we've definitely struggled um, because again, right, there are so many different formats with MR, you know, and not every system is, you know, Siemens has their own way of outputting data as well, GE. Um, and mm -hmm. then of course, everybody does things a little differently. So I guess it's sort of like trying to develop CDEs in a way, but for how data is acquired rather than Yes, but even just you know. DICOM formats already processed, even or NIFTIs, we can give all the process data. We have all the denoising, artifact reduction, removal, registration, everything is done. You know, we have spent countless hours on developing these methods and really cleaning up the data. It's, it's on our servers. Is there a way of uh, can you bridging? Can maybe this? provide some clarity on that? What do you mean? Uh, Dr. Keen has his hand up. Sorry, I didn't. Sorry, people. <clears throat> Thanks, Brittany. The only point I wanted to make is, um, you know, I, I wanted to go back to what Partha was saying, which was, you know, there's existing, there, there's, there's historical or archival collections, whether that's imaging or pathology, and the pathology obviously predates a lot of the imaging. And then there's new efforts like Partha's to build, the, that are building things from scratch. And so, and so then when we add in Dimitri's comments, which is basically, we have this data, it's in pretty good shape. Where can I put it so everybody can get hold of it? That to me represents the entire spectrum of what we're dealing with from a pathology perspective, even for pathology that's associated with people that have had imaging, right? If we just if we get rid of all the people that donated their brains 30 years ago and just go for people with imaging at all of the different sites that these brains are, are held, as Brittany really pointed out nicely, there's every place has its own me method of, of generating and tracking and storing and, and characterizing and all of that. And I'm sure the same thing is happening to the imaging to some level, although hopefully scan and these other things are making it more systematic. There's a really fundamental need for us to find a way without stifling innovation at each site to, 
to, to, to bring everybody up to a certain level so that key resources, and I'm not suggesting every brain out there, but the ones that particularly from our interests have some imaging data that could go with it. The brains that are from people that are really well characterized, maybe with PET and with MRI or whatever, that we can somehow get those to the point where Dimitri's talking about, where we could even get, the, where they would even be ready to be contributed to some sort of a centralized catalog or repository. We're not, we're not even close to that. And then, you know, when we tar- start talking about the, the big initiatives that are happening now and the brain initiative, I think is first and foremost in a lot of our minds, what's gonna happen with that 20 years from now, right? I mean, when you think about these Alzheimer's centers that have been in existence for 20 or 30 years, that's why we're, we have such a, such a heterogeneous mishmash of things happening because we haven't had an organized effort along the way to sort of maintain certain baseline infrastructure standards. We've had standard pathological diagnoses that we've been trying to get to and then the clinical set and all that. But I think, you know, for your, for your project, Partha, right, if in 10 or 15 or 20 years, when your grants are done, how is that, or when you've, you're at the next iteration of your grant, right, how are we making sure that, that that original data that you're generating now is still compatible and still, and still appropriate for whatever the technologies that are being used back in the future? I think that's the sort of issue we're dealing with now with, the, with especially the pathological specimens. And so I just wanted to sort of highlight that we're, at a lot of, we're, at, we're not even at the level that Dimitri's talking about with PATH at this point, and we're trying to get there. And Christine has her hand up. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to uh, comment that again, you know, in parallel pathways, um, the discussion about you know where to put the imaging and how to bring the imaging together centralized. You know, there are, have been consortiums that have started to do this, and certainly in the neurotrauma community, we've looked at this. But I'll tell you, in the aging community, it's a little interesting. And I'd actually pose the question to you guys from the data analytics side of how to handle this. Um, one of the things, there's there's two points to be made here, which is one, um, when you centralize stuff like that, and also with all the discussion, as you know, about artificial intelligence and machine learning, one of the things that has come back around that's now becoming a key discussion point, specifically in imaging as it pertains to data sharing, um, is the issue of reconstruction and the challenge now with how do we regulate and keep to true uh, the removal of PHI in the sense that you can take anybody's brain and reconstruct their face from it nowadays. And how do we actually, if we're going to give all of this to some centralized place, um, how do we do so in a responsible way? Um, if I, I would hope that as we think forward about this, just as Dirk is talking, you know, we're, we've got some steps to figure out that one of the things that we could all get a universal advisement on is guidelines and criteria for the centralization of this imaging data um, in a way that allows from a regulatory standpoint to um, adhere to that de-identification anonymization side of the fence because technology has advanced so much and because you can actually reconstruct and then you've identified somebody again. And then the second piece sub to that is that the issue of aging individuals and those that you know hit that criteria of over 90, um, we have them and they're amazing scans and I'm sure Brittany's group and others has you know quite a few of these um, that you know you have an addition, additional level of that uh, anonymization safety security that you have to go through. So so having some understanding to help us all do that in the same way, I think is is really important. And then the last bit, as far as the thinking forward is to make it worthwhile, even 10, 20 years from now, does the data group have recommendations for how that should all be formatted? You heard the terms nifty, you heard the term, you know, co-registration, blah, blah, blah. But in the imaging world, at least with the neurotrauma, we're talking about like, should it all be in bids format? Should it all be yada, yada, whatever the file structure should be so that it's all consistently um, there so that when it does go to the centralized source, we're not dealing again with mismatches across the board. So I just wanted to pose a couple of those to the data folks, because I think many of us could use some guidance in that regard um, and some guidance and particularly thoughtfully of, of how to handle these things as technology continues to develop um, and AI makes it even easier to uh, identify folks from, from those files. Thank you. I, if I can quickly respond, I know Harry has his hand up, but uh, a couple points. When you say recognize uh, faces from bra- brains, you don't mean pathology data, you mean MRI? The scans, data. the scans that okay, we're talking about. Okay, okay, that's about, a very yeah. different, okay, that's a very different story, but I, I would imagine that that could be solved by just segmenting the brains out 
and discarding the rest. So somebody would have to segment. Yeah, the it's, out, but, it's interesting uh, what you can still reconstruct. And that's the problem is the software's I, gotten even I, better. And I, so just I, I, the, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, you would need, um, I'd, I'd be shocked if you could uh, take stripped brains, not have the training data. If you have the training data, of course, you can link it back. But uh, if you don't have that particular brain in your database, uh, that you can reconstruct somebody's face from the brain. That's well, and that's that's the point. Technological to me, actually. Yeah, Partha is is, but that's the whole point. Is is what do we submit to you guys? What do we not submit? And making sure that everybody only submits that skull stripped. You know, there's ways to do it. You're exactly right. But that's what right. I'm saying is, I think we just need guidance for from a data analytics standpoint right, right, about right, how right. to do that. I, I do want to respond to the point you raised about data standards because it's been a, a big issue. I feel in the BICCN consortium with uh, histology image data or, or image data, there is kind of competing pushes, you know, the some people want to standardize everything. But then on the other hand, it's premature, you know, we are early in the field and the standardization simply becomes, and I'll be blunt, one group trying to push their standards on everybody else. And I think there should be more of a market mechanism where, you know, bottom up where there will be a proliferation of standards. And if there are users that prefer one standard that will end up, you know, kind of dominating, I, I, I prefer kind of the more uh, guided bottom-up approach where one doesn't enforce a standard, but one allows, suggests a few makes tools available and then, you know, allows people to use one out of three or something like that, you know, and, and also the other thing is they're open source, uh, not open source, I mean, commercial, there is the outer world, external world. So the formats that are being used in the external world, particularly for image data, um, not the MRI data, but, but for digital uh, image data, uh, one doesn't need to reinvent. I think that there are enough standards out there. Uh, so you're raising a very important point. How do we put these things together? Um, it should be discussed, but I my, my own take would be that one shouldn't enforce it from the top. That that's the only part that I would say. It should be more a discussion, um, people coming together and and uh, pragmatically agreeing on a few things, uh, and and then letting something win. You know, over over a period of time. That just want to throw in my <laughs> two cents there, uh, Harry. Uh, um, I, I, I just wanted to comment that, you know, the principle of keep it simple um, and baby steps may be applicable here in that uh, I'm not sure that we know, we have any idea of who has what where. Um, and I think Dimitri's point was, uh, was emphasized uh, that. So maybe the first baby step is a database of who has what where. Uh, and then my, 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 my second point, which Partha made was uh, standards and top-down enforcement are only gonna get people's cackles up. Um, and uh, potentially letting the free market reign. And if you are gonna put all the data, all of the different file types and approaches together, maybe the simplest approach is not to enforce standards, but inform what's there in what format and let the users select and do the data cleaning, the data harmonization uh, and so forth themselves. Um, and eventually there will be a winner uh, and that winner won't be on top for all time, uh, but at least for a handful of years, uh, there will be a winner until the next winner comes along. And that's where, um, I think not stifling innovation is uh, is going to be uh, uh, helpful. Words of wisdom. <laughs>
So in terms of having the standards, one thing the standards can really help with is the regulatory compliance because different IRBs, different institutions want to know, are they interpreting the guidelines in a safe and modern way? And this is especially true on defacing. We saw the link shared that showed even pet images have defacing problems. Um, and what is an acceptable level of risk for re-identification? Um, those are the kinds of things for legal risk statements um, and emerging technology. Do How worried do we need to be? Do we just remove the face? Do we remove the whole skull? Which bones can be shown if you're doing imaging of other parts? All of those questions of de-identifiability are things that opinions are nice, but having a, a standard and a status quo of, okay, you need to meet this, um, would make our lives much easier. Because we can do that in different ways, through different free market solutions, through different technologies to achieve that level of safety. But having our own safety standards just exposes us to risk. And then our um, offices of privacy or risk adjustment just shut it down and don't let us go or they ignore it until they find out there's a problem, then they shut it down. So those kind of things can which, really which is help. The correct, uh, which is the correct regulatory body here? Maybe they should help. Is it the FDA? Is it the, who regulates this? So, hey, Partha, this is Christine. I, you know, I can say at least on our side, um, it, it, it's, it's kind of the, the interaction between the um, human subjects uh, side for those uh, in life, and then we still actually get special permission for the postmortem. We get it. We we have an exemption on file specifically for postmortem imaging, even. Um, and now with the cadaveric, because we have the whole, you know, it's the whole cadaver. We're doing the whole heads. We can uh, re-identify. Um, and then it typically goes to a privacy safety office, at least. So we're at a state institution, so it might be different institution by institution. But uh, Bennett, thank you so much because yeah, that's that's the point is if we could have some guidance as we think forward as it pertains to data in this capacity because we're hitting these kind of key decades of aging and also just key elements of data that we're trying to bring together. Um, but yeah, so just to explain part, at least for us, that's that's where we start. So you're saying your regulators are local, but they follow HHS guideline and the, there's presumably a body. Uh, the, what you're asking for is who is it that signs off saying that yes well, there's a local sign off but it's federal regulation and the interaction actually like, this comes out even with grant proposals with the nih even um so there, there is a federal component to it which is why i think it would be terrific if there's an opportunity from a data analytics standpoint to also offer some guidance on this as well mm -hmm. sounds like a very important question because the guidelines are set out that identifiable information is protected and they list very clear identifiable things and then it's everything else. And the issue was where we skirt around is where is everything else as technology advances and how do we um, future proof enough compliance in a way that protects the individuals that have been working with us or donating to us while also fulfilling their wishes and doing the sciences on the data that they gave us to do the science on, right? Um, and so trying to make sure that we have a reasonable and consistent interpretation as identifiers when we have defacing, when we don't, um, how we monitor the data or safely store to the people we share those data to, how we monitor within that the students, you know, there's all of the levels of compliance and monitoring that we have. And health data is really exploding in this type of area. And so we are working on making sure that we understand the standards and applicability of where we put these around. And different states and different jurisdictions are then interpreting the national rules differently, which makes it sometimes hard to work across boundaries. Yeah, well, ideally, my dream would be to have some kind of an analog of GitHub, but for the for such an imaging data where you process the case you you have all the information to identify that you push there say to some kind of database that NIH maintains and maybe there is some kind of control that it is de-identified enough and then it can become public or if there is some standard processing tools to de-identify it and then 
you know, we can then say, okay, this is something that's publicly searchable. Is, is there a minimal standard, like saying that just brains call stripped are not identifiable? Has sounds like uh, it should be that way. I, th I think Bennett, Bennett says very well that there is everything else in this HIPAA compliance. Yeah. There is there is gray area there. So sounds like the federal government needs to give guidance here. It, it's not something the scientists can really decide, right? It's somebody needs to step in and say. Maybe NIH has the. Uh, so, uh, Car Car Carlos, it sounds like another <laughs> small workshop that is, uh, or, or meeting or something where you bring together the correct regulatory folks with whoever is on the data analytics side to give some guidance that Christine is asking for, right? Yes, Mark, no, I think that's a, that's a, a very good point. And I think the, thing we struggle with is understanding <clears throat> how much is too much intervention when it comes to the data, right? There's the, you know, the server, you know, and then there's the stuff that has to happen to the data before or after it's put on the server and the, the different layers, right? So it's very helpful for you all to talk in those terms so that, so that, that can be clarified. Over. But yes, but together with this data, you can put all the code that use, was used to process it. And you can put the DICOMs and then the end result, the NICTIs, uh, which have all the corrections, artifact removed and stuff like that. And here is the code. We develop such tools. We have get code on our group GitHub page. Happy to work with anyone who wants to use our tools, but in principle can show how it's done and, you know, if we want to deal with reproducible research, I think there should be some kind of trail like that. But ideally in some kind of centralized way so that 10 different centers don't have 10 different idiosyncratic ways of dealing with this. I suppose in genomics, uh... Uh, somebody or people went out and, and tried to identify publicly available data. That, that's one approach, uh, somebody trying to break the identification and, and, and seeing it, that it can be, one could do some research into um, looking at the publicly available data sets out there and seeing if they could, that somebody could identify it, that would prove that it is identifiable. Uh, that would open up a can of worms, perhaps, but uh, that that would be one way of determining it. I know that people did such things with genomics data. Um, I, I, again, it would be shocking if one could identify the face from the brain. So there must be some level where, uh, but one should test that hypothesis, I suppose, through a data analytic exercise. Um, the, 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 the skull is, of course, part of the neural plate, and um, it contains <laughs> some information. There's some correlation between the skull and the brain. But... It's scary. What if you have like, you know, thousands of brain cases where you can learn the mapping between the shape of the brain and the face? <laughs> you never know. So one of the questions that was posed earlier is um, relating to resources and groups, and we've touched on a bit in this conversation, what is what is needed to get these resources together um, or for MRI histology correlations for the brain? What kinds of um, consensus might come out of this sort of panel in terms of how do we say what we have and how do we um, maybe not exactly AI ML federate our data, but at least have people be able to approach the problem in a sensible way instead of having um, 50 meetings with 100 people and trying to piecemeal things together? Is there a way to streamline that? I'll put the question. B B Bennett, can we ask you about your thoughts about that question? You can ask me anything you'd like. Um, in <laughs> terms of what we're trying to do and build these clearing houses, um, it's tough. The amount of resources that go into standardizing common data elements when there isn't one together 
um, is, is really hard. And what we've seen in the ADSP is harmonization across sites is more of a problem than we've ever wanted it to be. From the way you ask people questions to the way the scans are done, to how the tissue preservation happened, and you get artifacts that, of course, somebody on this site well know well knows well, but on another site they've not experienced these because they do it in a different way, and so that's why this ADSP consortium with this federated tasking and getting domain experts in each one to do the processing and identify it has been really eye-opening to see that the depth of what you would do as a experienced user and someone who knows about this versus an expert user and that's the person who makes their lives in that modality um, in charge of bringing these things together. So at least in the Alzheimer's harmonization um, effort, there's been a, a quite productive team put together. Do if you wanna comment on what we're doing right or wrong, um, all for it. But as we look to other types of hypotheses and other types of um, efforts, it's really hard. And getting this to be a cost-effective way of bringing people together is, is something that I see a challenge for, and I don't have a good solution. Is there any disease or organ system or focused on brain here that has done this right? that we can look to for guidance. Yes, the brain has its own and diseases have their own things, but we're, we're, we're touching maybe upon a universal issue, not just an issue that's for our field. So does anyone on the line have any comments related to maybe breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, autism? I'm just naming some big heavy hitters in disease, but just thinking of stuff like that, is, is there somebody to go to that's the benchmark? It's a question about data standardization again, or um, because I think Bennett, the, what you spoke to is uh, from the heterogeneous sources of metadata, let's not data, heterogeneity yeah. of metadata, is that a better summary? Yeah, and I, I think we're, there's a lot of lessons being learned right now from the Capital Brain Initiative um, in terms of the large number of secondary analysis grants that were put out. Um, and so there are many people, ourselves included, that have uh, proposed to go back to existing data sets from multiple sites, do these analyses. And on our weekly calls, of which I think I'm missing now, don't tell the program officer, um, that we're learning about things that have gone right and wrong. And a lot of these are intermediate, you know, they're just a year, year and a half into their proposal. So they don't, haven't done it yet, but there's a lot of struggles and common areas. So maybe going, um, and looping back with the secondary analysis program officers, figuring out who has been able to solve these problems, bring together sites, is a way to learn these lessons and figure out what aspect of this funding was able to get that together. And then does this aspect of funding lead to something that is more sustainable than that one set of papers? How is the Brain Initiative recapturing all of those secondary process data, making them available, and really enlarging the ecosystem of neuroimaging and neuroprocessing. So those are the ones that I am seeing, sort of the, the Alzheimer's focus and then the Brain Initiative. And we're seeing comments on getting common data elements and actually I, I think i'll emphasize carolina's um you see a reuse of them use of the first time is great um but is sort of if you invented it and use it that's fine getting them used a second a third and a fourth and a fifth time so that they become actual common data elements rather than just data elements is is really a, a key thing and getting that community buy-in to respect your element and use it in a way that we can bring forward. I think it's really important. Um, and sometimes we need some practical, uh, some practical kind of uh, experience we've had is um, basic things, for example, age, sex, uh, you know, samples, uh, easier to standardize those because people are supplying that. But then when it gets to more uh, me metadata that not everybody is collecting even, then uh, um, perhaps it, you know, there's a gradation among these common data elements. Some will be more easily standardized or shareable. 
I think also the common data elements are really important, but I, I always err on the try of getting a sidecar, getting the elements that somebody has, which might not be common yet, but capturing their ad hoc spreadsheets or whatever it is in a non-relational database for possible future mining is really important. Because at the time they're sharing data, they may have a lot of context and information that if we capture now is cheap. If we have to get them all the way to CDs could be very, very expensive and it might not have the value yet. But if we can capture, in my mind, a NoSQL, a non-relational table, and then have that as the not yet CDEs, the future elements, the things that that medical resident might spend a semester mining because they feel like it, and we're not trying to broadly share is, is really important from an informatics standpoint and making sure that we don't lose the opportunity just because we don't agree on what these elements are yet. Um, Carolina, your hands up. Yeah, quick comment on that. So I think I managed the CD project at NINDS, but only the clinical CDs. So, you know, these, all the things that I'm hearing are challenges that all CD projects have. You know, the many groups developing their own thing, uh, lacking that commonality, um, not getting, you know, developing the same or different CDs and what you said that they don't agree on how the data should be collected, the permissible values, et cetera. Um, so I think that this is something that the clinical CDs have gone through already. We already um, hear that pain, we, we have that issue. So I think what I've seen in the last two years, especially with COVID, is that larger groups are getting together. So I think that the key here will be to collaborate. Do not create you know, all, all the silos that uh, already happen with the clinical CDs um, and talk to the other groups. I think um, someone mentioned before that to hear what other groups have used, have developed already, uh, what have worked, what didn't work um, and create Maybe if you don't get an agreement on a large group of CDs, maybe a core set of elements. I don't have experience in this particular area, but, and I don't know if it's possible to create a short list, like four or five, at least start with that. Um, and then you will have, you know, a harmonized way to collect that particular data. And I would say that the key will be, as you said before, the reuse, do not reinvent the wheel try to agree on something and try to agree, you know, and get as many people as you can of these large groups that are working in this area. Thank you. Okay, can I ask a question to you? Are, are there CD elements from those clinical, um, you know, efforts that are more broad and may pertain to neuroradiology, neuropathology? Is yes. There, is there like something that you have developed that you would like to yes. share? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to share the link. We have over 23 disease areas right now. Uh, and yes, that we have pathology, imaging, um, many CDs of all this. And I'm just dropping the link so you can see it by disease area in there. And this is not the only CD project at NIH. We do have, you can go, I'll, I'll drop the link of the NIH CD repository that are it's a compilation of all the CDs developed at NIH or most. Um, then we have, you know, more specialized, like in mental health, social determinants of health. Um, I can put together a list and give it to Carlos um, so he can share that. And definitely, I'm pretty sure that you'll find several CDs that you can reuse from that list. And sorry, Fitber, which is the uh, partnership that we have with DOD that are TBI trials, they do have also, we work together developing TBI CDs and they have also preclinical CDs on TBI. So these are great. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, the other thing I'm thinking, looking at this website, a lot of this and just what you said is disease specific, but what if we're trying to span everything? What is like a minimum data set that we could have across everything because I think that's what some of the things that I'm hearing from people is that as well as there's so many things that are so disease specific, like, oh, I looked at these types of things in this brain, these, what if, if people wanted a minimum data set, and I even heard about age, you know, gender, you know, all this stuff, what would that encompass? 
what would be that we could harmonize or at least have some sort of way across. I'm, I'm just thinking of stuff like an epic right you have the omop system if people are familiar with these terminologies right could we could we try to do an omop for, for our research to request to the organizers a lot of good information is coming out if it's possible to put out a wiki at some point uh with uh, you know collection of some of these links and uh it's like a one-stop shop might be might be useful Yeah, I want to also second what Bennett said about NoSQL, uh, you know, rich metadata spreadsheets. I remember uh, uh, attending a meeting at the NIH in early 2000s where uh, after a lot of talk about RDF and semantic uh, databases, somebody, some biologist stood up from the background and said, we still use spreadsheets. <laughs> I think that's still the case. Um, so at least the spreadsheet columns, right? Uh, I, I don't know, Bennett, if you have something to share about your actual experience with NoSQL. Yeah, let, let's go with, I admit that we still use spreadsheets, that sometimes a spreadsheet is a way to get it done, right? And if you're getting it done and it's done, then it's there. So yes, even computer scientists use spreadsheets and get things going along. You can manipulate them, you can search them, you can filter them, you can do a lot very quickly and dirty just like a barcode's better but you have a sharpie you can write it on and the sharpie doesn't run out of batteries very often um so making sure that we meet people where they are and nudge people in the right direction or in a direction that promotes higher value for their efforts um i'm looking at the fx toolkit that was posted um for fair data, I think that's a, a really important thing and um, can help us start to think about structuring these broader questions, especially when you're talking about a, a brain donation that somebody is making a very targeted long term gift that we hope we get a lot of information out of this, not just this one study, you know, thank you, Bennett, for volunteering this morning and getting an MRI. That's like, I don't expect that MRI to live for very long um in terms of sequence tuning or whatever else but when you have these very rich characterized data sets it's good that these bio brain banks have been around for 20 or 30 years because they're still contributing and they're still bringing tissue and looking at sort of a much broader window of humanity so getting those kind of things tied in and in ways that we can move towards um that GitHub idea, right? We're not going to get there with PHI and privacy and all of the different layers of approval. So you have access to these data sets. There's a lot that can be done to streamline of this lab knows how to store PHI. They're not going to try and re-identify and it's compartmentalized versus this lab is only working on DID data and now they're going to have rights restrictions and that kind of thing. But streamly aligning associations of who gets to use what and having our institutional signing officials not go as nuts like every time anyone asks our signing official to sign something it triggers an it audit and i get to meet our nice it guys and they walk through it and they look at the exact same thing they looked at last time but for paperwork every single call has an audit and we don't just certify we won't change anything without telling you um, so figuring out how to streamline that certification for reuse and streamline um, the applicability and the buy-in and the, the fair use of science, I think is something that the some of the NIH policies dictate that these things need to be signed and validated with every click. Some of them are local institutions overreacting or underreacting. currently playing with other support documents and trying to figure out how to get them legally signed. So Pat, I'm, I'm just noticing um, who you're talking about with the neuropath common data elements. And these people are amazing. I'm just thinking of some of the comments that people have made, especially with younger brains and stuff like that. A lot of this is very heavy in the neurodegenerative fields a little bit. So just thinking of other diseases that we want to be more encompassing on, not diminishing the expertise of those those names at all, but just thinking from that standpoint as well. 
to be more inclusive of common data elements. Right. I mean, they, they can describe to you, they tried to make them fairly broad, so they're not TBI specific, right? They're just to describe what was done to the brain when the brain was collected, how old the patient, uh, the, the case was, you know, things like that. So it is, they're meant to be very broad and we created core elements for TBI and for Alzheimer's disease using the NAC. It's mostly based on the NAC. So, um, but, uh, so other disease areas would just need to put in core regions to sample. So Dirk's on, he can really explain it to you. Yeah, Brittany, we, we, we tried to build on, as, as has been brought up with Carolyn and, and uh, others, we tried to build on what was out there. So those are based on, on NAC, UDS, and then uh, PLUS, right? And so we didn't get into the weeds too much, actually, on a lot of specific TBI related, especially acute TBI. But the idea was to use what's out there so that these could be harmonized. And uh, I know, you know, Nina's, Nina has been involved in some of this. I, I can't remember if, I, I don't think we've presented to the Neuropath Core Steering Committee yet, um, these CD, CDEs, but that's the plan. And, um, and so I take your point, you know, the group that was put together was just based out of the two U54s that the NINDS funded uh, and was really targeted to FITBER. But the idea was that we could be, we could think outside the box, that we could make this um, build on build on common data elements that are already well in use and most, if not all brain banks are very capable of collecting, but, but have, an, have an open end to this so that people could be sampling regions of brain that aren't part of the NIA guidelines. So people could be incorporating, you know, different um, common coordinate frameworks or, or, or these different atlases in how they're encoding the sampling that they're doing. Uh, and so I think it turned out pretty good. I mean, there's, it's always gonna be improved and having more people with eyes on it, I think is really important. I think it was out there for public, for public viewing for a while, um, uh, hopefully, um, but your point is well taken. The more, the better, as far as this goes. But there were quite a few people that are heavily involved in the ADRCs. And then of course the TBI world that were involved in this, as you can see. Yeah, and I just wanna make the point that TBI affects young people as well as old people. So they are actually uh, not age, you know, just exclusively uh, for the older ages. Uh, they, they're, they're intended to uh, pick up pathology in young people. And I think the plan is, as I understand it, there's a manuscript being written. Uh, we're waiting for that manuscript to be written on the Neuropath CDEs. And then the plan is to have a webinar uh, introducing uh, the ADRC directors and people that use NAC into the into the the, the neuropath CDEs, and um, I, I do think they're a, a huge improvement uh, because they had this hierarchical system of core elements and then uh, optional, you know, secondary and uh, tertiary elements. So it's a it's I think a very thoughtful approach to neuropath data. Thanks for putting the pressure on us, Anne, about the paper. Sorry, sorry, Pat. <laughs> I know I was just sending an email to John and Rebecca saying, oh my gosh, Ann just called us out. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're working on it. It'll be done very, very soon. I just wanted to point out it's uh, 2 33. We were scheduled to start with the breakout at 2 30, but we can probably keep this conversation going for a few more minutes if we need to. Um, I'll leave that up to you all or to Bennett. We have plenty of leeway if we need to, you know, want to continue this for a few more minutes. It sounds like we're good. I think we could take this energy into the discussions and then come back in a larger group and have the sort of detailed reports. Um, is there a five minute break in here? We, we can certainly schedule a five minute break before we move to the instructions and all that. We do have a break in between the breakout group meetings and the report out, but we can, yeah, we have plenty of time for a five minute break if we need. So. Or people can just miss the first five minutes of the discussion sections and either way is good. Don't, don't feel trapped to your Zoom, but, but people rarely do. Yeah, let, let's, just, let's just take a quick, a quick five minute break at least, and we'll get another break after the, the discussion itself so we can think about what, we, what you all want to put in the report and all that. Um, let's just come back at, at 2.40 and then I'll give out the instructions and we'll move on to the breakout session.
sorry, I was just reading a message I was receiving. Um, yeah, 242, I think we can get started with the instructions for the breakout session. So as I mentioned, we're going to have four, four breakout sessions. I believe there's almost 80 people present. So I think we can just divide up the breakout sessions into, or, or limit the breakout sessions to 20 per, per group or per topic. That way we're fairly evenly distributed. Um, so the first, or the, I guess the first breakout session will be training and interdisciplinary activities. And so for that session, we are we we focused or honed in on the following questions, some of which I iterated at the beginning of the workshop today. So those are how do we train next generation researchers in the field? What should the training pipeline be? So you know, how do we how do we restructure it so that it is more interdisciplinary? How do you cultivate more academically minded neuropathologists? And how can neuroscience be trained to be neuropathologists? It's truly necessary to have an MD for this work. Additionally, how do we enhance interdisciplinary collaborations? Um, so, you know, for example, facil facilitating collaborations with epidemiologists and neuropathologists. That was a theme that a big theme that emerged yesterday. And, uh, you know, what, what do we need to do to bring more people into this line of research? So the next uh, group is infrastructure and resource needs. Uh, so the questions for this group are, what are the resource infrastructure needs required to link neuropathology and imaging data? Is there a role for or need for central coordination, for example, central coordination of clinical data to funnel to postmortem imaging and pathology? Um, how can barriers be addressed? For example, planning for brain donation in pre-existing cohorts, creating a pipeline pathways for postmortem access and analyses. And what practices work well for acquiring diverse tissue or communicating with and informing diverse slash minoritized populations about tissue donation. The next group is methods and technology development. And I think we can probably refine these questions a little bit more um, in this session as well. So how do we solve the problem of scaling again? You know, neuropathology is done on a micron scale, while MR is done, you know, typically in millimeters or several millimeters. Um, are there contrast that can be developed to better correlate with neuropath stains? Um, what are specific methods that, that can be developed for, you know, linking uh, um, MR imaging to neuropathology? Is there, is there something that, that, that we can fundamentally change about how we acquire images? Um, is machine learning helping to identify reliable markers? If not, uh, what are the primary issues, barriers to this happening? And our last group is data harmonization and nomenclature standards. Um, so what are the issues that, uh, you know, we want to know what the issues that you experience communicating imaging, neuropathology, and their analytical findings methods between the different uh, subspecialties here. Uh, what do you believe are the best potential solutions to these issues? And what are possible courses of action to reach solutions? And how do you balance harmonization and innovation uh, such that you know, we want to understand what are the areas in which complete harmonization would impede innovation the most? And what are the areas in which it wouldn't? And so, um, you know, I think Derek um, showed earlier in the chat, uh, you know, what these groups are going to be. And of course, I mentioned that at the beginning, so hopefully you've had enough time to think about uh, what group you want to join. So in a little, in a, in a minute or two, Derek uh, from RLA will um, allow you to choose which group you want to go to. And for each group, right, we'll have the questions displayed on the screen. And we'll also hopefully have somebody or, or a couple of people at least volunteer to lead or moderate or more importantly, to take notes and be responsible for, for the report out. I had scheduled, I think about 15 minutes initially for the report out. We have four groups though. Um, and I think we'll probably at most need 10 minutes. Um, again, it's gonna be a report out. It's not gonna be a discussion. So we don't need a ton of time, but we do want, of course, details. Um, so, you know, Make sure you, you have, I guess, some detailed notes, and um, it'd probably be good to share that with us at the end as well um, in the Word document or something, and we can provide you an email address for you to send those, um, which I really appreciate that. All right, everybody. Well, hopefully, uh, each group was able to mostly formulate their recommendation. Um, I know there's a lot to cover here. Um, but again, right, the 
sessions have been recorded so we can always go back and refer to those as needed and hopefully you all will be able to share your notes with us if you don't mind um so i think we can start with the first group uh so that's a training in interdisciplinary activities so i don't know uh who's going to do the report out if it's going to be a few people doing that but um and Cini, i'll let you direct that yeah, thanks, Carlos. So I'm going to hand it over to Annie, who was uh, taking the notes, and also she'll be summarizing our major discussion points. Annie? Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Annie Henniker. I'm the neuropathologist for the UCSD ADRC. And um, we had a fairly small group, but it included um, an three MD neuropathologists, an MD neuroradiologist, PhD neuroscientists who are doing research and signing out neuropath cases. Um, they're a psych trainee wanting to do neuropath. Uh, the main points we hit are, uh, do people really need an MD to do neuropathology? Uh, kind of what are the barriers in place there? And then what are our solutions um, to kind of get grow the field of neuropathology? So essentially the consensus was that for research neuropathology, you do not need um, a MD per se. Uh, there are examples of PhD neuroscientists and scientists in our group who sign out the research neuropath cases extremely successfully and obviously add to the research. Um, the neuropathologists, MD neuropathologists, they love having trainees, love having PhD neurosciences neuroscientists present. So how come there aren't more people like this? Um, we identified kind of three barriers to um, neuroscientists and neuroradiologists and people kind of from outside the standard MD pathologist tract getting into this field. Um, the first one was funding, obviously. Um, if we're going to get PhD neuroscientists, their focus is different than ours. It's to get you know, high impact just papers and um, secure funding and the discovery driven research that um, often goes with human neuropathology is not as uh, well funded. There isn't a particular you know, study section that really these studies go to. Um, for a lot of PhD neuroscientists, this is kind of a pivot. So if you're pivoting to doing human neuropath, how do you really even begin to fund that? If you need prelim data, how do you fund getting that? Um, there's still an issue for the pure clinician. So like Dr. Folkworth was there. She's going to be president of ANP next year. You know, she's a great neuropathologist, but she's 100% clinical. Everything she does for research is on top of her clinical stuff. It's basically pro bono. So um, funding is a huge issue. Uh, Respecializing, I kind of touched on, that's hard. Like grants are focused on mechanistic studies, doing kind of what we think of as discovery driven science is um, not necessarily what people are funding as much. Um, and then finally, mm, pivoting is hard. So we, need, we think we need to grab people early, uh, get them engaged in neuroscience or neuropathology. Everybody agreed that some of our best trainees who really get hooked are like the young people, the uh, undergrads or the med students. And then we kind of realized we need to make neuropath more cross-disciplinary. So there are people with great expertise, engineers, neuroradiologists who we're just not even tapping into. Um, our answers to this aren't like extensive or you know, complete, but um, the first thing is there is an effort to make neuropath um, reach toward younger people. We have an R13 grant, and if there are like trainees on this, we have this R13 grant uh, specifically geared toward uh, training the next generation of neurodegenerative neuropathologists. So that's run by Eddie Lee, who was here yesterday, Julia Koffler, uh, and me. We've had, we've done this uh, workshop preceding the ANP meeting uh, for the past three years. We just got funding for five more years. And basically the trainees have this um, fairly rigorous workshop the day preceding ANP, and then they also go to the meeting for free. Uh, from this program, we've had like 25 people complete it, more than half are academic neuropathologists now. 
And we do take PhDs um, and we've had MD neurologists. We have not had any neuroradiologists. And so actually getting the word to that cohort, um, we should just think about, like we hadn't thought about it. That's obviously important. Um, and then the second point we're trying to think about is how do you fund people to do this type of work? Um, Brittany mentioned Dennis Dixon, who's like basically the granddaddy of a neurodegenerative neuropathology has never had an R01. Uh, how do you actually get this work, uh, human tissue studies appreciated? Uh, and then finally, how do we um, make the brain banking community into a community? So um, thoughts on that were in addition to the R13, maybe like a particular meeting focused on brain banking, um, maybe making brain banking kind of having there be smaller conferences within AASC or at, within some of the big PhD neuroscience meetings um, to get the PhD people hooked early. And that's really it. Thanks, Annie. Carlos, back to you. All right, thank you both. Um, so the next group is the infrastructure group, which uh, uh, Rebecca was moderating. So Rebecca, go ahead. Sorry, I did not unmute. So um, Dirk is going to be presenting on our behalf. Great. Um, and Rebecca, do you have the questions you're going to put I was those? just going to say, let's see if I can share. If not, it's okay. So I'll start. If so we had a uh, dozen or so folks. I can't, I can't, I didn't write everybody down. We had a, a really nice mix of, um, of uh, folks from primarily the brain banking world and also uh, NIH uh, folks. And so um, Rebecca, that's really weird. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say that did not share appropriately, did it? <laughs> I'm not but sure what happened there. It's totally fine. I have the I have the <laughs> slides you sent too. So I'm gonna be brief. Um, I'll just I'll just um, so this was infrastructure and resources, and we had a, se a series of questions. And so we um, uh, like the education folks. We spent quite a bit of time on the first one, um, uh, which was what are the resource infrastructure needs required to link neuropathology and imaging data. And the consensus with our group was that we really don't know what the resources are to know what the infrastructure needs are. And so within, within a certain network, um, for instance, we could take the Alzheimer centers. Um, there's a, a wide variety of what is available uh, that could be useful with respect to neuropathology, neuroimaging, right? And with imaging, I'm thinking about obviously imaging of donors before death and as part of an MRI or PET study, but also imaging post-mortem imaging like an ex vivo scan or a cadaveric scan. And also, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of imaging data that comes from whole slide imaging. And so what is available within some of these networks, neurobiobank network, Alzheimer centers, um, you know, the, 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 what, is, what is even available? And so, um, so, I think uh, I think Nina said, you know, really, it's a needs assessment. We need to know what we have before we can really understand what is the infrastructure needed to leverage that for research. And it probably doesn't involve linking every specimen in every brain bank everywhere, but it probably does involve some thoughtful. Um, thanks, thanks, Rebecca. Some thoughtful consideration of uh, of of getting some form of an inventory for what's out there, especially across disciplines, because we're talking about TBI, that goes across disciplines and VCID especially, but all of this infrastructure that the NIH has invested in. And then, and then once we have a better sense of what's out there uh, that's available, then we can start to think about infrastructure. And along those lines comes the idea of a central coordinator or a central coordinating center. Again, I'll refer to the Alzheimer's centers because I'm very familiar with the Alzheimer's Centers and, and the Neurobiobank. The Alzheimer's Centers have a national coordinating center. The Neurobiobank is centrally coordinated from a data, from a data perspective. And so these are the kinds of, of, um, of, this is the kind of infrastructure that needs to be leveraged to really build out the, the infrastructure that would, be, that would facilitate research from a neuropathology and neuroimaging perspective. And so again, we're at 
a point where we, we need to really have a good assessment of what we have within these different networks, which networks, and I would advocate probably all brain bank networks ultimately should be connected. And then what level of coordination is needed. I don't think any of us would advocate that everything needs to be centrally stored, right? Whether it's imaging or especially pathology specimens, but that would be one aspect of this. And from the other end of it, we, we talked about like NAC just got a, we, we, as a first step for the Alzheimer's centers, we NAC essentially generated a, what kind of cases do you have and in what format at each of your centers, not specific to the cases, right? Which all the way to the NeuroBioBank, which will give you on their website, a list of the, of the cases and the specimens that they have. So I think there's a general agreement that some, some central coordination would be really valuable in facilitating this, a go-to place for scientists interested in, in neuropathology and neuroimaging research, either to facilitate that sort of research or to, or, or to utilize the expertise and the, and the data that's available from the imaging and neuropathology uh, researchers. And so that's, but again, it's a little bit, it's a little bit open-ended because there aren't solutions. And one of the comments in the group was, you know, the recognizing the challenges of the funding agencies to and NIH and why this this workshop and other ones are so important to try to get a handle on what the best next steps are, because there's our pipe dreams that are probably never going to be fully realized, the sort of the best case scenario, but definitely progress that we've all been making and hope to continue to make. And then and then we pivoted. Um, toward the end to what, what, I, what I think we all agree is a really, really critical problem, and that's representation in research. And, um, and that goes both on the researcher side and on the research participant side. And we spoke a lot about brain donation, um, but this, this, of course, spans uh, all aspects of what, we're, of what we're talking about. And so generally, we all agree that, there's, um, that we need to have better communication, better awareness for the public about brain research, about the value of brain donation. For we need to be better at listening. So we need to ask the public and ask these different communities, what are their questions? What are their concerns? Listen to that and try to try to try to address those concerns. And some will be probably readily addressable, and some may be very difficult. Um, but the best way to do that, we thought, uh, and I think, I think, I think has been proven over and over, is that. We really need people in science from these di diverse communities that can go back to their communities and communicate with them, with people in those communities, why this is important, why what the benefits of participation are. And one of the greatest ideas I thought that came from our group that some people are, some banks are doing is to follow up with the families of people who've donated to, to reach back into these communities and let them know what's come of their gift to science of the of the greatest gift that a person can give, in my opinion, for, for research. What have what has come of it? And you don't have to say, well, your loved one participated in this, that, that, and the other study, but just to say, this is the research, these are the big discoveries that have been made this year. And our research, uh, our, our bank participated in those great discoveries, and your loved one participated in those great discoveries. We all thought that would be really helpful and something that none of us do. Uh, do a lot, but some centers are, and we could learn from those centers. So I think that's, I think that's pretty much what we talked about. I think uh, the last point was th what mechanisms are available to fund this kind of work, and that's a uh, that's a big question. Uh, you know, supplements certainly to existing grants, but you know, some of this might not fall under an existing grant, and some of it really needs to be built out into future requests for applications and grant funding opportunities to ensure that. Brain donation and, and imaging are considered at the front end so that the people who die early in a study and aren't part of a brain donation program in, and the people who die late long after the study's funding has ended are able to participate in, uh, in brain research. And so um, Rebecca and, uh, and group members, please add anything that I missed. I think that's about what we talked about. I think you covered things really well, Dirk. Happy to let anyone else chime in. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dirk. So now we'll be moving on to the methods and technology development group, and uh, Parth is going to be summarizing that for us. Um, we definitely had a, some varying perspectives, so that that took us uh, <laughs> some time to get through. 
And I think I think what we're gonna do is just summarize both of those perspectives on uh, the scaling problem. Um, so uh, thanks, Ross. I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. I think we had a really vigorous and excited discussion. I think the main topic that came up was scale um, and recognition that there are at least a couple different problems being discussed. One is, um, one could call it the clinical scale, which is correlating the uh, clinical MRIs to um, uh, what is the, um, uh, what the anatomic pathologist looks at uh, for diagnosis or analysis. And that is to some extent an engineering or techno technology problem that one needs machine learning methods for perhaps, and, uh, and it might not even be a science problem, but just putting those two things together might help um, prognostic um, interpretation of MRI images. So that's one uh, set of uh, kind of challenges. Um, and that requires certain kinds of data, maybe sampling techniques for the brain regions, co-registering those um, um, uh, to uh, uh, little chunks to the big chunk, and then within the little chunk, the images to the little chunk and so on. And then there's another set of technique, which is um, really to deepen our understanding of the disease mechanisms or the interpretation of the MR signal at even more detailed scales. And that requires electron microscopy, uh, confocal imaging for the molecular workups uh, to go beyond pathology, which uh, you know perhaps uses some techniques that are uh, tried and true, but, but certainly uh, older uh, techniques. Um, and um, th those were, uh, in fact, diving uh, downwards from the optical scale uh, or, you know, from the, at least on the pathology scale, and then um, kind of zooming out upwards to the MRI scale was uh, um, in, in some way the theme of our discussion. Um, so a couple examples would be uh, improving the interpretation of MRI, which is, you know, whole brain, 20 centimeters, um, is a clinical scale goal that might be more accessible at present, but some things where more effort may be necessary are modeling at the subvoxel level to figure out which fundamental microscopic parameters are truly relevant, um, uh, maybe giving the pathologist a better understanding of what they are seeing uh, through a combination of uh, molecular, uh, uh, you know, careful stereological analysis using confocal imaging and so on and so forth. So Carlos, I don't know if that summarized um, and uh, perhaps uh, we should also let others uh, speak and add uh, to that. Yeah, I definitely think, yeah, especially, you know, Constantino or Dimitri, Stephen, if you want to add, Bruce, you know, wherever, feel free to jump in. And, uh, yeah, I think that the Barca covered there. everything uh, quite well. Uh, I, I think that there is uh, a lot of things that obviously we need uh, to do from a technology point of view. Uh, there is a lot of room for improvement, uh, a lot of things that need to be done in terms of machine learning, registration, uh, uh, how we do pathology faster, uh, more completely uh, for the, the brain, etc. So uh, in terms of uh, techniques development, uh, I think that there is no, no shortage of things that need to be done. Um, and uh, we could probably have uh, several workshops that will be discussing every single uh, uh, aspect of this. Uh, but yeah, the, the, I think the scale that uh, Partha uh, just uh, mentioned is uh, very important to realize that it's not just one kind of thing, one kind of scale that we're interested in. Uh, we, we have a, a range of uh, problems that require a range of scale, uh, a, a wide scale. I agree with the summary. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to to um can you hear me carlos yeah yeah I can hear you. yeah i i'd like to um kind of try to bridge what was said with regard to the first uh breakout group in terms of the fellowship and and kind of the the vigorous discussion that we had which i think might at the end of the day boil down to the need for um training more individuals who are human neurobiologists if you will that I think what we were taking out of our, our discussion was that, that we have a need to bring the latest tools in neurobiology 
in some instances to try to understand what's happening at the MR level. And to do that requires cutting edge neuroscience. And that what we ideally would like to be able to do if we're training PhD uh, scientists to do this work is to kind of take away the mystery of studying human brain tissue because there, there are, I think a lot of um, PhD scientists don't study the human brain because it just seems to be a very daunting and inaccessible exercise. You know, how do you get the tissue? How do you study these big blocks of tissue? How do you uh, deal with the fact that it's been fixed in fixatives, which are not really amenable to the kind of tools that we standardly use as neurobiologists and so forth and so on? How do you deal with the big statistical data sets and all the clinical information that's got to be correlated and all the clinical confounders? You know, that's what I think the fellowship ideally would, would do is train a new generation of neurobiologists who would be human neurobiologists who could then work at that interface uh, between say MRI and neuropathology to do those sorts of studies. Mm -hmm. Even harder is to how to bring physicists and applied mathematicians into this field. Oh, that, that's easy because no. those, are the, those are the smartest people so they'll learn more quickly but they have all choice in the world to work on many other things. That's true, but we might be able to entice them. <laughs> but I think they could do the work. We have examples like Cindy Brenner, who was a physicist and then you know won the Nobel <laughs> Prize in neurobiology and molecular biology. So the physicists can learn, they're very good. You know, that's true. I, I, I did jump from condensed matter physics to, to MRI myself over 14 years ago, but those jumps are rare. And most of my Felix colleagues have no idea what, that, what this field is about. <laughs> there, are there are real barriers, cultural yeah. barriers. No, well. there absolutely are. You're right. Thank, thank you all for sharing those summaries and, and those thoughts at the end. That was very helpful, especially bridging right what we discussed with um, with the uh, recommendations from the first from the first group, and so now we have our last group, the data and nomenclature standards. So I guess Pat or Alba, uh, you can start. Hello, Mimi. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alba Racinos, and I will be representing um, the data standards and nomenclature harmonization um, group. We had a lively conversation. Um, and I hope I do the summary some justice, uh, but feel free to jump in if, um, if I miss anything. Um, so Dr. Valdowen did uh, start off the conversation letting everybody know that when it comes to nomenclature, um, nomenclature will help you create data standards um, which are needed to harmonize that data. So some of the challenges and problems that we um, focused on are that, um, or that were brought up um, were that when it comes to reading imaging studies, the imaging studies results are actually uh, described pathologically. Um, and that's one of the problems. So when it comes to nomenclature gaps and bridging those gaps, another issue that came up was, um, for example, microinfarcts can't visually be seen, but when it comes to, uh, because it's three millimeters and under, but when it comes to a neuroimager, um, it would be considered a macro infarct. Um, other things that came up were um, descriptions as far as what's a cortical infarct versus what's a caudate infarct is different um, when it comes if you ask a neuropathologist versus a neuroimager. Um, so there isn't a lot of standard guidelines as far as. Um, what areas are named. Um, so it's left up to the neuropathologist to make that decision. And they're the ones that um, describe the, the area that the infarct's in. Um, and that would be different, um, a different interpretation depending on who you ask. Um, there was also um, differences when it comes to amyloid um, positive. So um, when it comes to scans versus neuropathology, um, so that leads us into implementing, implementing the data standards into workflow. 
and what NIH can do. Um, should NIH look into uh, establishing a lab book or something um, that would be useful to distribute? And um, the biggest thing that we came up with was how can we keep it simple and how can we help? Um, and one of the biggest things that uh, came up was um, communication and language is a big thing. Um, so we would look into considering surveying um, individuals and making sure that um, the data being collected is actually uh, going to be useful um, as far as instead of making diagnosis uh, when gathering that information, it would be more um, gathering what you're, um, like gathering symptoms or gathering uh, data rather than tying a diagnosis to the actual, um, to the actual thing you're reviewing. Um, and it would be more of, surveying each um, specialty to make sure that whatever information is being collected um, is actually accurate. Um, because what may be interpreted uh, by neuropathology as one thing um, can be interpreted by a different area as something different. Um, so creating a data set um, that just asks questions still wouldn't be helpful if that data is looked at one way in one area and a different way in a different area. Um, I hope I'm communicating that correctly. Um, but uh, the last area that uh, we hit was um, metadata standards. Um, and depending on what you're studying, um, that area would be something uh, that would be more difficult to standardize uh, between centers. Um, but uh, path rating would be helpful as far as clear querying um, those stats. Um, and I think um, Dr. Irwin mentioned something about um, digital scanned images um, also being useful. Um, but that's all um, as far as um, my summary goes. But anyone else that was part of um, the harmonization group, please feel free to chime in. So, yeah, I can chime in. So I, I think just that the other component was just that, you know, creating, developing the nomenclature for the ADRDs and the data standards that Alva talked about, that one of the issues that uh, I know the pathologists that have been working on this with the um, ADRD committee for already emphasized that we should focus on research only. So, you know, try to get some common nomenclature for researchers to use and data standards for researchers to use so that um, we don't run into, because you open up a can of worms as you expand into bringing in the clinical sphere of cut, making <clears throat> their nomenclature match the research nomenclature. And that NIH can be a, a, a leader and convener in this process, which is like, you know, all I already said. But. I, think, I think we talked about too, maybe bringing together pathology pathologists and imagers to maybe develop a set like the strive standards were brought up yesterday and sort of developing sets of, of position papers where we're all agreeing on the same nomenclature and terms so it's hard to make sure we're measuring the same things if we're calling them th different things and so I think maybe efforts toward we did talk about maybe it might be worthwhile to have different position papers um, that are collaborative in those regards. All right, seems we've finished with a summary for the last group. Um, but yeah, I guess that brings us to the end of our workshop, um, for better or worse. <laughs> so definitely thank you all for attending and for being very active participants. Um, again, thank you to you know our discussants who took a lot of time out of their busy schedule to have several pre-meetings with us to make sure that this meeting went smoothly. Uh, that we've honed in on, on really some of the bigger issues in these fields, you know, emerging in V1, X vivo, MR data with neuropathology and the interpretation of all of that. So thank all of you. And of course, thanks to our NIH and RLA staff who helped put this meeting together. Um, you know, 
could have done it without all, all, all these folks helping. Um, um, we could have done it without well, all these folks helping. And, and we certainly have a lot to consider on our end, um, as you know, we, we certainly had a lot of recommendations come out of this, or, or at least, you know, I guess it can be considered formal recommendations, but things for us to think about it and how to help the field, um, you know, with respect to not only training, you know, how, how do we bring more folks into the field? Do we really need everybody to be an MD that's a neuropathologist? Um, you know, increasing diversity supplements um, for trainees to visit, you know, different brain banks, understand how the, how how that workflow occurs. Um, you know, and even more importantly, I guess for this work, right? How do how do we increase that donation of brain? Um, you know, we, we do need studies to really consider this from the get-go, um, especially for large epidemiologic studies is crucial and it's an invaluable resource, and especially with all the clinical data that's acquired. Um, and of course, you know, with, with this scaling issue, there are as we saw from from the summary, right, definitely two lines or two perspectives on how to how to how to meld the <laughs> the MR data with the neuropathology data. And I guess it depends on, on what the ultimate goal potentially is for the researchers. Right, again, we want to improve prognosis and diagnosis, and we try to do that as soon as possible. Um, but we also want to do that accurately. So it seems like we need to merge. The use of the what are what is uh, re what are readily accessible tools that we have now with the more um, you know complex uh, methods that are out there. And lastly, of course, a, a common theme that has emerged not only throughout our pre meetings but throughout um, this workshop is right the, the the issue with nomenclature. Right, if we're not speaking the same language, how are we going to truly move forward? And so you know, again, lots of things for us to consider. Um, and how we can possibly address these through, you know, the ways the ways that NIH that, that NIH does. Um, so I think um, I don't know if anybody from the NIH side wants to chime in and comments on anything else, but I'm happy to let whomever given uh, provide any other closing remarks that they would like. Well, I'll just say thank you. Uh, to you, Carlos, for sort of spearheading this, and and to other members of the uh, of the team that uh, really just put in an enormous amount of work. Uh, also, a great thank you to all the uh, session leads for because uh, I think it was five meetings actually before before the workshop, and so people put put in a lot of work, and I think it really paid off. From what I could see during this workshop, uh, you know, a lot of uh, really thoughtful uh, comments and input. And, um, you know, I think that uh, the last comment that was made about, you know, getting together uh, different, different individuals, groups to think about how to move the field forward and possibly writing, writing things up uh, along different fronts, I think is worth uh, following up on. So, um, but th thanks to everybody for, for a great workshop. Over. All right, please give yourselves all a big round of applause. <laughs> um, but yeah, with that, um, I think we can finish the meeting. I hope you all have an excellent rest of your week and have a great weekend. And we'll be in touch somehow or another in the future. <laughs>